All right, we're at time to begin. We're in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And Chris, would you lead us in prayer, please? Yes. Please bow for me. Our great mighty Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we give thanks to you for this beautiful day that you have created. We thank you for the chance to be here, Father, to worship and study your mighty and holy word today, Father. We pray that as we go through this lesson, that you will be the brother Stephen, let him deliver your word to us, Father, in a manner which we may understand, in a manner which pleases you. Open our minds so that we may receive it, Father. Father, we pray that you will be with those who cannot be here today with all the sickness. We pray that you will continue to please touch and heal them so that they may rejoin us. So we pray, oh Father. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We give his life upon the cross so that we may one day have eternity in heaven. We pray for your forgiveness for all the sins that we have committed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> all right, Philippians chapter 2. Um, the end of chapter 1, Paul 27 and 28 had urged them to be of the same mind, to stand fast with one spirit striving together in the gospel. And he touches on that continuing down into chapter 2. Evidently there were some tensions, some difficulties among the saints at Philippi. And he's urging them to be sure that they are united together in Christ. And he makes an argument down through chapter 2 about having blessings in Christ and then Christ being our example and then urging us to have that same type of mind. And at the end of the chapter, he gives a couple of examples of people who exemplify that type of attitude, who have walked in the way of Christ, if you will. So Philippians chapter 2, let's read verses 1 through 4 to begin with. 1 through 4, who will grab that song? Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, and being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Okay. Well, question number one I had asked in verses one through four, what's the key to unity here? What's he talking about in these verses, Ron and Nancy? He's saying here that we are to have the same love and mm -hmm. we have a standard that we are to conform to. And if we all conform to the same standard, then we have unity because we have the love that has been manifested to us because that we didn't know prior to Christ. Right. Christ brought to us an understanding of love that did not exist until His life in manifestation for us. Right, right. Nancy? Well, obviously my answer would be <laughs> the same. Right. It was love. The intent to be loved. Yes. Have that love for one another. And something we want to notice here is the New King James Version says, therefore, if there is any consolation. Sometimes the word if means it's like a question, if there is or if there isn't. But sometimes the word if means since. Like, if you're going to do the dishes, then I will do the laundry. And I'm not, it's, it's not the question of whether or not you're actually going to do it. It's, well, since you're doing it, I'm going to do this. And what he's talking about here is if or since there is consolation of Christ, since there is love, comfort of love, since there is this fellowship, 
And, and he's asking in a way, you know, do you recognize this? You need to acknowledge it, accept it. So all these things exist. There is consolation in Christ. There is comfort of love. There is fellowship in the Spirit. There is this affection and mercy. So because you have this relationship in Christ, because you have these blessings that are from Him, you enjoy these things that He provides to you, then this is the type of attitude or mindset that you should have. So there's these things that you enjoy. Now here's how it needs to affect you. What, how it needs to guide you in life. So he says, verse 2, fulfill my joy. Um, fulfill his joy in doing what? Verse 2. By being like-minded. By being like-minded. How does that bring joy? To Paul. Because unity brings about peace and harmony and the constancy <laughs> of purpose that have that individuals have towards the salvation of their souls. And that's ultimately what we're seeking is to be with God for eternity. Yes, that, that is our ultimate goal. And as Paul is writing to them, just let's remind ourselves of his relationship to these brethren. What is that? Is he just some random stranger that, oh, I heard about these people over in Philippi, I'm going to write them a letter. What's his relation? He was there from the very beginning. He taught the, the Philippian jailer in that household and the uh, Lydia in that, in that household. So he, he was there from the get-go and knew those folks from the most basic level. Okay. He's got a relationship with them. And he cares about them. And he cares about that work at Philippi. Um, how many of you, have, first of all, been involved in a work in a congregation other than here at Newton? Okay. How many of you have people you love that are part of another congregation? If you hear of that congregation where you once were or where people you love are having problems, how does that make you feel? It's troubling. It's distressing. If you hear that things are going well, that they are united, they're standing together, the people, especially the, the ones maybe that you're closest to, they're being blessed, they're growing, how does that make you feel? Brings great joy. And he's telling them, based on this relationship, that, you know, fulfill my joy. So, there's this element that he's appealing to, your relationship in Christ. But there's also an element he's saying, help me. Help me feel good about what's going on there. Don't bring me grief. And you know, we can appeal to one another based on that. Yes, ultimately our relationship is to God and we're to seek to honor Him and to please Him and to bring joy to Him, not to grieve the Holy Spirit. But let's also understand we have an influence with one another. We have relationships with each other. And he's saying, make me happy here. Do the right thing. Don't, don't cause me to be sad because of the way that you're behaving. Sort of like how parents appeal to their children sometimes. You know, do, do the right thing. It, in, it'll make me feel so much better. Don't do the wrong thing because I'm going to be grieved. But be that as it may, when we're unified as a congregation, we can bring joy to others. We can bring a blessing into the life of others who know about us that may have some relationship to us in one way or another. Any other thoughts there? Alright. So they're to be united in mind and united in heart, being of the same mind or uh, one accord of the same love with one another. Uh, how are they to view each other? Verse 3. Better than themselves. So what does that mean? That we need to care more that they're given going the right way to get to heaven. Yeah, we, 
we're very concerned about their needs, what is affecting them, if they're walking in that path of truth, not thinking just about myself, but thinking about them, esteeming them as better than myself. So looking out for their best interests. Any other thoughts there? And, and it doesn't matter if they're better than you or not. You might be better than them, but you are to hold them better than yourself, regardless of their station in life, the, you know, regardless of their intelligence or you know what they what they do, you are to hold no, no matter what, you are to hold them higher and, and think of them as better than you are. So we are never to think ourselves better than somebody else. Because that's what that instruction is. It's esteem, but it's also you hold them better than yourself. Yeah, your viewpoint of the others affects your attitude and therefore your actions toward them. So when you think of them as better, you're going to act in the right way toward them. You're not going to act in that selfish way as he said there. Don't do anything through selfish ambition or conceit. So be thinking about them and you will treat them properly. Have that attitude. Have patience and kindness and exercise restraint at times. Any other thoughts there? Well, and when we do these things, you know, Paul, as you mentioned, wants them to do this for his own benefit, but ultimately, when we're unified, when we're treating folks as we should, when we esteem others better than ourselves, we're doing that with the common denominator of the gospel, and that brings glory to Christ's name, ultimately, is, is the, the basis for all of this. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing, and that's why Paul says this is, this is why all this is so wonderful, because it brings glory to Christ. The church, God. Right, right, exactly right. Exactly right. All right, let's read verses 5 through 11 now, please. 5 through 11. And notice as he gives Christ as the example. Who will get that? Right, Chris. 5 through 11. Let this, mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who, be, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking from the from a bond, uh, excuse me, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And at the name that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to give glory to give the glory of God the Father okay so question two I'd ask explain Jesus being in the form of God What does it mean he was in the form of God? He kept his deity even though he was flesh. So he was both God and man in duality while he spent time here on this earth. Okay. What, what does John 1 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And in verse 14, John 1, the Word became flesh. So, being in deity, that's his state of existence, is really what he's looking at here before he came to earth. So, being in the form of God, do not consider it robbery to be equal with God, or as some translations have a thing to be grasped. So, what's it talking about? He didn't consider this robbery or a thing to be grasped. He already had it. He didn't seize it, didn't take it by force, and his state of existence in heaven 
was not something he held on to. Ron, you have something? I was just going to go ahead and finish your thought. But I was just going to comment on John 17 and verse 5. Okay. And now, O Father, glorify me together with you with the glory which I had with you before the world was, which is what you were stating there. Okay. So tying a couple of things together, what he said, it, it, as the Lord is about to go to the cross, and he's looking forward to not only his resurrection, but his ascension back into heaven. You know, glorify me with the glory I had with you before he came into this world. And remember in Matthew 17 and other accounts where he went up on the mountain and he was transfigured and his glory shone forth. While he was here on earth in the form of a bondservant, that glory was masked. And men didn't see that glory. He had that glory in heaven dwelling there. All the blessings, all the benefits of being there in heaven. And he left that abode, came to this earth, lived within confines of man. He hungered, he thirsted, he got tired, all those types of things. He faced ridicule and rejection even by his own family. So he came, he left that glorious state of heaven and came into this world. Now, one of the things, two, two points I want to make. One, I cannot explain being 100% deity and 100% humanity. I can't, explain, I can't explain how my soul dwells in my body. I'm not going to attempt to explain deity and humanity being combined in one. I accept what the Bible says. It says He was fully God, fully man. Okay. Let's understand Jesus could never stop being deity. That's impossible. It's like saying we would stop being human. Right? When Nebuchadnezzar was struck by God and he went and lived as a beast in the field, he was not a beast. He was still human. But he lived as a beast in the field. But he was humanity. Jesus came to this earth was not merely a man, as some have tried to claim that he gave up deity. No, he, he lived within the limits, the confines. He lived as a man on earth, but he was still deity. So when we read this here, we understand he was deity and he came to earth taking on the form of a bondservant, taking on flesh, as John 1.14 talks about. And he lived among us here to an end and to a purpose. In fact, as he states it here, or maybe I should say, how does Paul state his end, his purpose? Why did he come? Verse 8. To, the death, to, to die on the cross. To be the sacrifice. Right. He humbled himself so much that he went all the way to death, even the death of the cross, which is pointing out how horrific that type of death was, a result of torture. And so he went to that extent. So what's Paul, to sort of wrap up that first part there, verse 5, what's he telling us? What's he showing us here? He's saying that Christ did these things to show you, to show us, how to do what Paul just told them in the previous verses. He's telling us to be humble. He's telling them to put others first. And then he explains how Christ did that. And, the, and yes, you know, Christ died on the cross for our sins. And he was God and He gave up all His rights and didn't exercise His rights as, a, as, as God. But Christ showed us how to do exactly what Paul just told those Christians that they needed to be doing. Here's your ultimate example in the Son of God. If He can do that, then there are sacrifices you can make. There are changes you can make in your life in order to benefit and to bless your brethren and have that same mind, have that love that is necessary for the people of God. Any other thoughts there? Alright, so, 
Verses 9 through 11, then what does he tell us? What's the name that is above every name? Sometimes I think we look at this and we, when, when we think of name, we think of Jesus. And in a sense, that's, that's here. But what, what does the name Jesus mean, by the way? What's the Old Testament name for Jesus? Joshua. 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 What, is, what does that name mean? Deliverer. There, there's a sense of deliverer. There, Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. So this would be the idea of He's the Savior. But He is Lord. There's a name that is above every name. He is Lord. He is Master. He's our Master. That is the exaltation that He has received. He came to this earth and He lived as a bond servant. He came to serve men, not to be served. So He was the lowest, if you will. But then after He came and He served and He fulfilled His duty, where is He? He's the Christ, the Son of God. He is above all. Right? He has a name that is above every name. He is the one who is ruling and reigning at the right hand of God in heaven. So, He went from this earth in the grave to a throne in heaven. So, question number three I ask, what's the contrast between verses 8 and 9, becoming obedient to death? What lessons can we learn being exalted in heaven? Any lesson to learn there? Well, Paul's telling these, these Christians, if you take Christ's example and do what Christ did, Christ was humbled Himself and as a result, God exalted Christ. And Paul's saying, so if that happened to Christ, if you do what Christ did in Christ's example, humble yourself and be obedient, well, in the end, you're going to be exalted by God the same way that Christ was in heaven, ultimately. So... You know, put put yourself to the side, put others first, <coughs> put Christ first, put, put God first, and God will exalt you just like Christ is exalted. Humiliation before exaltation. There's pain before there's pleasure. There's the cross before the crown. Clint. And this is a pattern of teaching that we see in the New Testament often. Those who are going to put themselves last will then be first. Um, you go to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. So there's that, that key period. There's a temporary time of subjection. There's a temporary time of you putting your cross on. There's a temporary time that you will put others before yourself and then you will be exalted. You will be glorified and you will be given a gift of salvation if you're conditionally correct with God. Oh, to me, in these verses, the lesson is obedience. The result is humility and exaltation. That's, those are the, the two uh, byproducts. But obedience is the lesson in that verse. Verse 8 became obedient to the point of death. And so his submission to God resulted in this exaltation. Our submission to God drives our behavior toward others. And that's what Paul began with here, here's how you need to be. You're, you have a relationship in Christ. Now here's where it needs to lead. If you're submissive to Christ, this is how you're going to be. And look at the example of Christ and what His obedience resulted in. And then the exaltation of Christ in the end. And that's... We want to keep in mind that there is a reward that is coming. We are going to be rewarded and we will be greatly rewarded for our submission to the will of God, for obedience to Him, for the sacrifices that we make. It's there. 
and He's ready and willing to give it to us when we fulfill our duty. And if we can understand these verses and understand the point that Paul's trying to make, well then we can realize, you know what? This is how I'm joyful in my suffering, in my serving serving God, as Clint pointed out, for this temporary amount of time. That's, that's how Paul could have joy in suffering. That's how we can have joy in suffering because we're doing this in, in honor of God and in the, the hope the hope that's that's within us in uh, in this service and obedience that we're having. Ultimately it's gonna to lead to a home in heaven, but if we can grasp it then we can understand how we can have joy in our suffering. There's a purpose to it. It's not meaning it's not suffering for the sake of suffering. There, there, there's a reason behind it. And it has meaning to it. Alright, let's read verses 12 through 18. Philippians 2, 12 to 18. We'll grab that for us. Mike. <clears throat> so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the days of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Okay, so question number four, I'd ask, how do we work out our salvation and does this mean we merit it? In 2 Peter chapter 1, you know, he talks about the divine nature. And he says, if these things be in you and abound, you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. So it is taking on, of course, the divine nature. And we understand that we are to serve God not as men pleasers with eye service, but with all sincerity. And so as we look at this, you know, it is not through meritorious works that we're saved, but the just shall be saved by faith. But faith requires an act of obedience, as you were just describing, with the nature of Christ. So in these things, by practicing these things and perfecting ourselves, we're working out our salvation. Because of bringing out this divine nature that he's talked about, and that we are God's creation unto good works. And so we have to work the the faith that He has given to us. Yes, Chris. On that same note, though, each one of us have stumbling blocks in our lives from young to old throughout our lifetime. And as we work out these stumbling blocks which cause sin, and we walk away from those issues, we are working on our salvation at the same time. Okay, there, there are things that we have to get rid of out of our life. There are sins. There are things that we struggle with. We have to get those out of our life. There's also growth. There's also maturity that we have to work on it as we go along. Um, Nancy. Well, in Luke 17, 10, Jesus said, When you've done all that you've been commanded to do, say, I am an unworthy servant. For what have you done that was not your duty to do? Right. That pretty that talk about humility. Exactly. The the thing that baffles me about many of our friends and neighbors is they they want to divide grace and works. They want to put grace and works in opposition to one another. And that puts you in the position of essentially arguing you do not have to be submissive to God and you can still go to heaven. Well, how, what command of God can you not keep and be right with God? Well, the obvious answer to that is none. And as we've been talking about here, this idea 
of being obedient, working out your own salvation, is simply the idea of submitting to the will of God. That you are allowing Him to direct your life instead of you directing your life. You're allowing His will to be the primary focus in life instead of your own will. And you let Him guide you. And so you submit to Him in all things. Um, Paul says here that he's essentially pleased with their obedience when he was with them and when he's been away from them. So he's giving them a compliment. You, you've been obedient. And essentially he's saying continue. Continue to do this. Continue to work out your own salvation. You've been working it out. And whatever difficulties, whatever stresses they're facing right now, he's basically telling them, don't let that get in the way. You be obedient now. And with the things that I'm telling you, having the same mind, having the same love, having that, that fellowship with one another in the Spirit, keep working on that. And don't allow that to be disrupted or to be destroyed. So we understand as he's telling them about their salvation working out that it's not an automatic thing, but it's something to which they must apply themselves. Now, of course, obedience implies there's something or someone to obey. And it implies there is a standard. Mike? Well, in verse 13 it says, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work in His good pleasure, and is that word for means because of what I just said? And that is, in our obedience is where God does His work. When we are disobedient, God doesn't work inside of that. And there's a big misunderstanding in the religious world about our work, and that is that it's work of ourselves. No, it's the work of God. <clears throat> God's told us what we ought to do. His obedience to Him is where God does His work. When we're disobedient, God's not with us. He's not working inside of that. He's not going to make it out to where everything is okay for us whenever we're disobedient. Right. We're stubborn. We're resistant to God. <laughs> That's not doing what He's talking about here. When we are submissive, we, He is working in us to accomplish His will in this world. Now, um, any thoughts down through 13 there? So 14 to 16, he's essentially saying that as we serve God, we are an influence for good in this world. Now he says, do all things without complaining and disputing. The idea of the complaining there is the grumbling or dissatisfaction. And if you look this up, the original word has an emphasis on the internal. This word is very often translated as thought. And then, without disputing, has a primary meaning of deliberating with yourself. So, when you think about that, what, any lessons to draw out of that? As a man thinketh in his heart, so that whatever is in there is going to show externally. Okay, those things will come out, right? Anything else? Where's the battle? The battle's right here, right? Because sometimes we will excuse ourselves because we don't express something. And he's saying, look, you're, the root of your problem is going on in your head. And you're having these grumblings, this complaining, this disputing. Internally, you're having this debate and you're unhappy. Now, that's going to come out. That's going to affect your relationship with your brethren. But you need to get rid of that in here. Clint? I'm just going to go back to verse 30. It says, do nothing from rivalry or conceit. If you don't do what 14 says, then you're going to be... In rivalry, you're going to be. Now that's the direct outcome of not putting yourself in check, and that's what I feel like this verse is saying: is you've got to cast off all those wars that are within yourself. You have to win them. Mm -hmm. You can't let Satan win. Right. Work out your salvation. This is not. Uh, 
something that's simple. It's, it's simple in one sense, but it's a challenge in another to bring those things in subjection, to, to restrain that mind, to discipline and train that mind, to get rid of that complaining, that grumbling, that disputing, those internal debates and thoughts that, that lead to those broken relationships and those difficulties. So get that in check. Now, self-reflection is good. Looking at ourselves, contemplating our life, our attitude, whether or not we're serving God is good. That, that is good. That's not what he's talking about here. But get rid of that doubting, disputing, understanding God's way is the right way. You know, sometimes we chafe against that. But God's way is the right way. And it may be difficult. It requires sacrifice. As he's already pointed out, look at Christ and the sacrifice that he made. It requires sacrifice. requires obedience to the extreme. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so it requires extreme obedience to the Lord. That we may do what, verse 15? Prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Okay. So how do we shine as lights in the world? Okay, we, we get rid of the complaining, the disputing, but what else does he go on to talk about here? What kind of world do we live in? Crooked and twisted. Crooked and twisted, dark. And it's not just the first century, it's today. It's always been since Adam and Eve partook of that fruit, darkness has prevailed. Well, and that's what I was going to say, is light, light displaces darkness, but it's obvious. And uh, it, it enlightens. So we have to be, we have to, we have to be without reproach in order to shine. Because if there is reproach, that's that belongs in the realm of darkness. So we have to be without reproach in the world. And what what's the what's the first thing a critic's going to see? They're, they're going to see that fault. Right? You, you can be as pure as the wind driven snow, but you got a stain, that's what they're going to see. They're not going to focus on the rest. Gonna, and, and they'll do it hypocritically, of course, but we have to be careful and set that example as Nancy's talking about. Blameless and harmless children of God setting forth that right example. He says holding fast the word of life or holding on to that word of life, holding the gospel and that's how you're going to live that pure and righteous life and being a light in this world. Um, why did Paul want that? Verse 16. What's his appeal there? Mike? Well, all this that he's been doing and all this that um, the apostles, every, everything that we all do can be in vain. And if they falter... All the stuff that he's worked with, from looking jailer on to this letter, is going to be invented for nothing. It's just a waste of time. Okay. Would he like his imprisonment at Philippi to have meaning? I, I did that for good. I'm okay with that. I'm okay. But if it goes for not, it's not so good. Right? We're okay with sacrifices. Sacrifices... I think most of us understand, look, if the sacrifice is to an end for a reason, for something good, a good outcome, I'm fine with it. It's perfectly okay. But if I made that sacrifice and it goes for naught, that bothers us. And Paul's saying, look, I made these sacrifices for you, I've labored for you, I've helped you, and unless you stay faithful, that'll all be in vain. So don't let it be in vain. And their labors would be in vain, of course. So Paul talks about as he wraps it up that he did all that he could to help the Philippians to be saved. He describes it here as being poured out as a drink offering. What's the idea of a drink offering?
A drink offering would be offered with another sacrifice. It's in addition to it. So that's the illusion he's giving here that I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice in service of your faith. So you're making a sacrifice and I am like an additional sacrifice, a drink offering, which by the way, a drink offering was wholly poured out. And this has some allusion to the idea that he's willing to shed his blood as a drink offering, as an offering for the Philippians. If, if that's required in the cause of Christ, not only for them, but for others that Paul had worked with, but he's willing to do that. And he says, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Don't be upset about what's happening to me. Rejoice. I, I willingly make this sacrifice. Any other thoughts there? I was going to say that in um, verse 15 it says, so that you will prove yourselves. That word prove means to become. So don't do things with, um, with grumbling and disputing so that you can become blameless. In other words, it's a process that you go through and it's a never-ending process as well. You are always proving, always forming, shaping your life conforming to what God wants so that you can become innocent and blameless. Right. It's that process. Continual growth and maturity in the Lord. Alright, let's read verses 19 through 24, please. Who will grab that for us? Clint. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven work, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Okay, question number six. What does Paul commend Timothy, or commend about Timothy, and what practical application can we make? Let's give you an example. Here's somebody who has done it. So what does he commend? What does it say about Timothy's attitude? There in verse 20, it seems that he's describing what already talked about in the beginning of the chapter. Mm -hmm. I have no one else who's going to care for you like he does now to send to you. He's going to, you know, he's going to put you first. He's going to serve as a sacrifice for you so that you can be you know, with God. He was genuinely interested in the salvation of their souls unlike any other person would be. Timothy, if you recall, was with him and working with him at Philippi. He's not prominent in Acts 16 there, but he's there. And so he has a relationship with them. He cares about them. And Paul's saying, look, he, he has the exact same attitude I do toward you. And so receive him. He's going to help you. He's going to be a blessing to you. Ron? Yes, over in 1 Corinthians 4 and 17, we see, again, that nature that Timothy had. He says, for this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who, re excuse me, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. And so, as you mentioned, he was with Paul when he went to Philippi. He has demonstrated this characteristic previously. So Paul has this confidence knowing as he was describing here in this second chapter, those characteristics that Timothy possessed. Yes. And here's a beautiful picture of where you have one man who is prominent in the gospel and the cause of the gospel and helping to establish that church at Philippi and another man who can come along and be a blessing, a help, and encouragement. In other words, it didn't solely and wholly depend on Paul that the gospel could go forward and the work could be done and souls could be saved even in the absence of Paul, even though he's restrained. It can be done in that way and through Timothy because he has this great characteristic of love and devotion to the brethren to be ready and willing to serve them. 
And I find it interesting that Paul, in verse 19, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. He didn't know for certain. They say, I'm trusting in the Lord to send him to you. You know, sometimes I think we get the idea that the apostles had everything revealed to them, like every action of every day, everything that was going to unfold in the future, and they didn't. They didn't know what the future held. God revealed the gospel to them, God revealed the truth, and God revealed some things in the future to them, but some things He did not reveal. In fact, the revelation, the uh, prophecy... Of future events was very very rare and so he's saying I trust in the Lord and then in verse 24 I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly we've already discussed in chapter 1 he says well I don't know about living or dying I think I'm gonna live but I really ultimately don't know so he ultimately doesn't know this he had this great faith and imagine him who had received so many revelations not having that knowledge or information. Sometimes, I, I don't know, maybe it was frustrating to him. Well, why didn't he just reveal this also to me? But he had to learn trust in these situations, just like we need to learn trust in these situations. So let's read verses 25 to 30 and close this out. Who will read that for us? 25 to 30. About Epaphroditus. Go ahead. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been long before you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Okay, so who is Epaphroditus? He's obviously somebody they're very familiar with. Maybe someone who wants to that is now no longer involved. Yeah, they, it. From what we read here, he had been sent by them to supply what was lacking in their service. And you get on into chapter 4, plus combining what it says in chapter 1, they had sent support to Paul, and it was evidently at the hands of Epaphroditus. He was the guy who actually carried it there. And he was with Paul for some time, and now Paul's saying, I'm sending him back. What was the distress that came up that he's talking about here? Well, it says that he was sick, and then later on it says that um, you know that uh, he came close to death for the work of Christ. For the work of Christ. So I don't really know how that all worked out, but uh, whatever it was, it was serious enough that they were very concerned about it. Right, and and when you read down through this, you get the 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 sense, the understanding, there wasn't a miracle performed on him. He was close to death here. But he survived. But Epaphroditus was worried about them being worried about him. He was concerned how they would be distressed. And so he is being sent back to give them a measure of comfort and to send messages back to the church at Philippi and no doubt Paul's thanks for the support that they had provided to him. Now, question number seven, I'd ask to list the various descriptions of Epaphroditus and what they mean. So how is he being described here? Because Paul's setting him forth as an example, specifically naming him. Also, his brother, a fellow Christian. Brother, a fellow Christian? Soldier. A soldier? Which implies what? Fighting for the truth. Yeah, he's in the battle. He, he's out there fighting for the truth against Satan and sin. What else? A worker, which oh. means working alongside Paul with preaching and teaching. Yeah, he's out there getting after it. He, he's a worker with me. He's a laborer in the gospel with me. And then it says, your messenger, which that word is literally apostle. Remember that terms in the New Testament 
are understood very often within the context and it's just simply saying he was the one sent by you to help me and he was a blessing to me now as he wraps it up there verses 29 and 30 he tells them to esteem him for his work's sake for the work that he's been involved in and it's just a reminder that those who are serving and laboring in the gospel that we need to esteem them, we need to appreciate the fact that they have devoted themselves to that work. And that's not just preachers that we're talking about, but anybody who has committed themselves to the cause of Christ, they need to be esteemed. We need to appreciate them and uphold them. Alright, well we'll close it out there. And uh, Lord willing, Philippians chapter 3 next week.